Dr. Burley. Thank you very much. Um, it's an absolute pr pleasure uh, to get to, to bring this to you tonight. Um, as I was telling Bernie, um, it's kind of an unusual day for me. I rushed home from work and uh, found out we have no air conditioning. And in Arkansas in June, that's a bad thing. So I'm sitting here in the den with a bunch of fans on me. So if you hear background noise of fans, uh, please forgive me. Um, second thing, I struggled on how to how to label or how to name this course. Uh, you see the the name that I have on the screen. That's really not the best name. Um, the best name is the tricks that I used to get a good sleep practice going. And I hate to say tricks, but that's kind of what it is. Um, most of you, if, you, if you've done dental sleep medicine any length of time, you know that getting a referral practice going is, is quite difficult. And um, not only is it difficult, it's, it's really frustrating. So I'm going to give you the tricks that I used to get mine off the ground. Um, now looking back on it, you know, after, you know, seven or eight years now of doing this, um, it almost seems logical how I did it, but at the time it didn't seem logical at all. So, um, anyway, we're going to, we're going to really look at, at the tricks. Um, when I originally spoke to Lorena about what this lecture could be, we talked about all kinds of things, but in actually putting to, putting it together, in my opinion, what what practitioners need to know is the the things that are necessary to become part of the club. By club, I mean uh, the one that the sleep physicians refer to. So anyway, that's that's what we're going to try to try to accomplish. Um, I'm going to try to get this. I'm assuming y'all can see this on my screen. So I'm going to try to get that. No, I don't want to leave the webinar. So nope, we'll just ignore that then. So anyway, um, y'all know I'm from Arkansas. Uh, I'm not politically correct. So if I say something that offends you, just understand that whole political correctness thing hasn't made it to Arkansas yet, so I don't mean anything by it. But uh, anyway, um, I will always tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. I have no agenda. So uh, just kind of understand I am what I am. Um, I am the principal owner of Burley Consulting, and that's something that's kind of developed over the last few years. Um, I consult on board complaints and risk management issues, and um, my wife and I provide coaching and mentoring services for for practices that uh, want to really get their 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 DSM practices up and going. So that's my disclosure. Um, I mentioned that one time and no other time. So anyway, you already know I'm the the diplomate of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, who also is, is an attorney. Um, not only am I an attorney, but you can see I practiced for a number of years, practiced law and was a full partner in a law firm. I'm licensed to practice law in Arkansas and Texas. And uh, currently I'm only licensed to practice dentistry in Arkansas. Um, had I known that the Arkansas Razorbacks were going to be playing in the World Series at 6.30 tonight. There is no way we'd have been having this webinar. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. So if at 6.30 you start hearing me pause and do a go hogs or something, just forgive me. The uh, TV is on in the background turned off or turned down. So. Um, obviously, um, I'm a Razorback fan. Can't say anything else. 
when I when I teach the big courses, my whole goal is to teach uh, teach my patients, or excuse me, teach my dentist how to pitch. And by pitch, I mean where do you get your diagnosed patients, and how to get them diagnosed. Also, you have to know how to do insurance and how to successfully treat your practice and how to communicate. And by communicate, I mean, how do you communicate with physicians the way that they communicate? That's a, an area that is highly overlooked by most dentists that, that practice dental sleep medicine. I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of the way I communicate, um, but it's incredibly important. So uh, but anyway, let's get into this. The real goal of this practice or of this lecture is to teach you how to develop a rever referral based dental sleep medicine practice. I want the sleep physicians in your area to refer to you, okay? I want you to be the one they think of when they need somebody to have an alternative to CPAP. Once you develop the, the physician-based re referral, then you start developing the PCPs and internists and cardiologists and endocrinologists, and now I've got pediatricians referring to me. Um, so it, it you know, snowballs, but it snowballs after you get the sleep physicians on board. So our goal certainly is to uh, is to do that. I'm going to try once more to get this thing off my screen. If not, I may have to have Bernie to help me. Nope. Okay. I, again, I don't know if y'all can see that on my screen or not. I, I hope not. Anyway. Bernie, are you there? Okay. So anyway, uh, continuing. Uh, we all know that that OSA and sleep disorder breathing is rampant in this country. Um, there have been all kinds of estimates as to how many people have it. We all know that there are millions, uh, there are million, or excuse me, billions spent each year in healthcare expenses attributed to sleep disorder breathing. So um, we offer a viable alternative, and we want to be a part of this industry. So the problem. Before you can treat a patient, we all know that a sleep physician must diagnose your patient uh, with obstructive sleep apnea. It has been determined that, that OSA is a medical condition and therefore we cannot diagnose this. So um, the diagnosis is a result of an overnight sleep study. Now that can either be a PSG, a polysomnogram, which is an in-lab study, or an HST, a home sleep study. Either one of them are perfectly capable of diagnosing your patients, but those studies have to be read and interpreted by a board certified sleep physician. Getting a diagnosis and a prescription from a sleep physician can be a big problem. Um, again, before you treat, you must have a signed prescription, ideally written by a sleep physician for an oral appliance to treat the, the OSA. And this is an area of, of misunderstanding for most, most dentists. The reason you have to have a prescription is that we're not actually treating the patient. We're providing a piece of durable medical equipment. Just like, just like if we provided a wheelchair. Uh, so since obstructive sleep apnea 
and its treatment by a mandibular advancement device is a has been classified to be durable medical equipment for durable medical equipment to be provided a physician needs to diagnose a condition that can be treated by durable medical medical equipment he has to determine that that piece of durable medical equipment is medically necessary and he has to write a prescription and the prescription has to be filled by a dme provider as a dentist practicing dental sleep medicine we are that dme provider so obviously the there has to be a letter of medical necessity signed by the prescribing uh, prescribing physician there is quite a bit of misunderstanding about what type of physician is required to sign that prescription you need to know that all protocols as of this time say that that prescription and letter of medical necessity must be signed by a sleep physician not a pcp not a cardiologist a sleep physician now when the 2015 practice parameters came out that made that determination um needless to needless to say i was majorly upset because here in arkansas we have a lot of military and and many times these guys don't have a local sleep physician and and they've got to have an oral appliance because they're headed to iraq or wherever and we don't have time to get get them established with the local sleep physician so um i called the aadsm and spoke to everyone i could and and basically um the only thing that i have that that i can say is that randy prince the secretary of the aadsm wrote me an email and said jerry barrett who was the executive director said that it was okay for a pcp to sign this however uh you need to know that that's not what the the protocol says so a uh, sleep physician and a it should sign a letter of medical necessity as well as your prescription okay sleep physician respect or in in reality it's sleep physician re referrals you're not going to get that by asking for it sleep physician referrals or sleep physician respect has to be earned it took me forever to figure that out i thought if i just went and I don't know, brought them a, a thing of nuts or brought the receptionist flowers or, you know, wrote them letters that they would refer to me. They won't. Let me just say it. They won't. Um, you literally have to prove to them that you're going to file insurance correctly, successfully treat the patients, and communicate with them like physicians do or they're not going to refer to you so you just always keep in mind before sleep physicians will refer to you you've got to earn their respect the good news is once a sleep physician knows that you can be successful and treat his osa patients well he will refer 82 to nothing 82 patients is how many patients i referred to the five local sleep physicians in my area before i got one to treat i was so mad i didn't even know how to how to react but the good news is it taught me a lot 
I now know how to get their attention. And that's what I'm going to teach you today. So you don't have to go through those 82 referrals. So the question, where are you going to get your patients? Yes, I know you've got a world of patients in your practice with OSA, but they're not diagnosed. Okay. You need to find diagnosed patients you can treat, and then you need to develop a way to get your undiagnosed patients actually diagnosed and in a situation where you can help treat them. That's what we're going to discuss. If they're undiagnosed, how are you going to get them diagnosed? And will you for, refer all your patients to a local sleep physician, get a PSG? And how will you get a per prescription to treat your patients? So the issue is how common is OSA? If you look at this graph, the red part of the pie graph is all of the patients in the country that actually have OSA and yet are undiagnosed. If you look at the wedge where you have the green and the blue, that wedge is all of the patients that have actually been diagnosed, okay? And that's about 15%, 12% of the people that actually have OSA. The green part is those that have been diagnosed and yet unsuccessful with CPAP the blue part is those that, is that are actually successful. So I want you to look at that and now think of it not as all the people in the country with OSA, but think of it as the people in your practice, okay? It took me forever to realize that big old pie could be actually looked at as my practice. So I have all of the red or the people in my practice that actually have OSA and are undiagnosed. But I have people in my practice that are diagnosed and using CPAP. And I have people in my practice that are diagnosed and not using CPAP. Okay, big trick number one. In my practice, look in the bottom left-hand corner, and you'll see that I found 22 patients that their CPAPs were in the closet. Once you realize that and figure the, the, the normal price that you have for, for fixing an OSA patient, that little fact can make you many thousands of dollars. Those 22 patients that I found turned out to be my board patients for my ABDSM, American Board of, of Dental Sleep Medicine board patients. So the first thing you need to do tomorrow, go to your practice, send out an email, and let your patients know that you are now qualified to treat obstructive sleep apnea and offer a, an alternative to CPAP. And if they're one of the many patients who have been diagnosed with OSA and cannot wear their CPAP all night, every night, please contact your office. So anyway, within a short period of time, I found these 22 people. The surprising thing, uh, let me go back. The surprising thing was the 51, what I call partial CPAP failures. If you ask those people, are you wearing their CPAP? They say yes. But what they really mean is when my wife nags me into it, I'll put it on for the first hour of sleep. And the minute she goes to sleep, I take it off. I found 51 of those in my practice. Okay. So 73 individuals 
turned out to be the patients that I use to prove to the local sleep physicians that I could file insurance appropriately, that I could successfully treat these patients, and that I would communicate with them just like they communicate with each other. So trick number one, find these patients in your practice. I guarantee you they exist. The 51 were the hard ones to find because they lie to you. I mean, they will cold, bold face lie to you. Sometimes you have to ask their wives, okay? But once I found them, the 22 were easy to find. They had just given up on it, okay? The 51 were the tough ones to find. Go find those guys and it will change your practice. So, unfortunately, there are two ways to practice dental sleep medicine, and you really need to choose which way you're going. The first, I guess, protocol is the sleep physician, sleep lab dependent practice. You get your patients by referrals. Obviously, this is the technique that I want you to, to adopt, but you will not go out and make, make huge bucks overnight because you have to earn the sleep physician's respect. The second way is what I call the independent practitioner approach. Your patients, you get your patients from your practice. You do not get the you, you do not get the patients by an MD involvement. You do not refer to a local sleep physician for diagnosis. You keep total control over the treatment of the patient. Obviously, local sleep division, excuse me, sleep physician dependent approach is the approach that I endorse, but get ready. It's going to be frustrating to get established. The independent practitioner approach, the good is there's no physician exam, no PSG, so you can go right to treating. The RX is usually from a non-physician, non-sleep physician, uh, usually the patient's PCP. You do an HST with a remote physician diagnosis. Obviously, the big negative is the dentist, the treating dentist, could be completely responsible for the health of the patient. The reason I'm going through going over all of this because I went over some of this in the last lecture. This is brand new, okay? The AASM just put out this this brochure, and I want you to know the effect that it has on us in dentistry. It says, and I hate to read it to you, but I think it needs to be. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine has begun a nationwide initiative to defend the scope of practice of physicians and advanced care providers and uh, manage patients with obstructive sleep apnea. And they're defending them from the encroachment by dentists and other practitioners who are not trained or qualified to diagnose a medical disease. The AASM distributed to every state medical board a copy of the American Medical Association resolution, and it's the one on obstructive sleep apnea. The resolution was introduced in November of 2017 at the AMA meeting. The adoption of the resolution followed the publication, its publication in October of the AASM position paper um, on home sleep testing. The uh, AASM AMA position said obstructive sleep apnea is potentially lethal disease and um, it's critical to ensure patients receive a quality of care from medical providers and so on. Sleep apnea commonly occurs with uh, serious comorbidities, including hypertension, heart disease, pulmonary disease, 
you know, so uh, an MD needs to be involved. But this is the AMA resolution. And it basically says the underlying parts are the most important. It says the ordering and, in, and interpreting of objective tests aimed to establish a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea or primary snoring constitutes the practice of medicine. The number three is objective tests for diagnosing OSA and prior, primary snoring are medical assessments that must be ordered and interpreted by a licensed physician. The problem with that, it really doesn't delineate or talk about titration or screening or any of the things that we tend to do in dentistry, and it is in direct contradiction to the ADA policy statement. Uh, this is just part seven of the ADA statement, um, and it basically says that we can titrate with uh, oral appliances with type four and uh, type three and type four portable monitors and they may, may be used by dentists to uh, find the optimal target position of the mandible. Obviously, the ADA policy statement and the AMA policy statement are in direct contradiction. So, the problem that we have is that we have all of these documents floating around. And my worry is that some dentist is actually going to go around their physician friends and not have a physician involved, actively involved in the treatment of a patient and some patient's gonna have a heart attack. Um, when that happens, you know, it could be really ugly. So my in my professional legal opinion i don't want you using an hst as a dentist for diagnosing osa i don't want you using a remote sleep physician i don't want you ordering a sleep test out of your office i have a number of of clients that are doing that and they're actually um, you know filing medical insurance for those purposes and the end result is now there's audits and they're being asked for that money back so don't do that okay and you need to know if you get sued the AADSM practice parameters will be introduced as your standard of care and I charge $600 an hour to get you out of trouble. So don't do that. So what have I done? When all of this came out, I sent all my sleep physicians a letter saying, hey, we've got the AMA resolution and the ADA resolution. And I set up a meeting. Uh, I took them to dinner and I said, look, this is what's going on. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to titrate? If you don't want me to use a Gym Pro or don't want, want me to use, you know, uh, an HST to titrate, I won't do that. So I actually got my sleep physicians on board with what I'm doing. And I told them if I get turned into the board for, you know, using HSTs or for practicing medicine, without a license, you're going to be the first guy I call to write a letter to the board to get me out. Additionally, I asked them how I want, how they want me to screen for OSA. So anyway, in my area, my sleep physicians are actually encouraging me to, to screen with, with a Gym Pro, screen with HST, titrate with a Gym Pro and a, a Nox P3. So I'm not worried about my practice in Arkansas. 
but you need to do the same thing in your area. Don't tick a sleep physician off and you'll never get referrals from him. So anyway, with that being said, um, you know, you need to find out what they want you to do. So the good of the sleep physician approach, you get to slip, share liability with sleep physicians. It's easier to defend in court. It allows you to file all medical insurance and Medicare, and you have no cost to obtain your patients. The bad is it's difficult and time consuming to get established, but I have a, a way to get around that. Uh, there's a risk, you know, that the first few patients that you refer will be placed on CPAP and you'll never get an opportunity to make an oral appliance for them. But we're gonna talk about my way to get around that problem. So the question, and this is the $64,000 question, does your patient have any TMD signs or symptoms? Okay, we all know that probably 75% of all of our patients have some joint sounds, okay? You need to know that there are, are some, some research out that actually shows that when a patient is put on CPAP, many times they develop TMD signs and symptoms. So we're gonna discuss all of that. So anyway, all the patients in my office, in your office, need to be screened. The likelihood or likelihood of having OSA needs to be determined. There's a number of ways you can do that. Obviously, Epworth Sleepiness Scale and Stop Bang and Berlin. I don't care how you screen, but you need to find those people that likely have OSA. Once a patient has been identified in my practice, they get screened with either an HST or a Gym Pro at no charge. Do not file medical insurance for this. I don't charge them even for the disposables. I want to know whether they've got any signs and symptoms of bruxism or whether they've got TMD issues. So I do either a Knox T3 or a Gym Pro, and I do that because I don't want to be wrong when I refer this patient to a sleep physician. As you know, we're, we're, we're struggling for credibility with the sleep physician, but we're also struggling for credibility with our patients. And in today's world of $5,000 medical insurance deductibles, if you, if you refer that patient to a sleep physician and they do a, an in-lab uh, sleep study, you know, the patient may get stuck with paying most of that out of their pocket. So if the screening is negative or if the, the, the sleep, uh, the PSG is negative, then you have a, a patient that's not very happy with you. I'm not worried about when I screen them about uh, the cost of the disposables. The reason I'm not, because if they come up to not have any significant signs and symptoms of OSA, I can always come down and determine if they're bruxing and make them a night guard or obviously a TMD appliance and all that is still on the table. So I would say 90% of the time that I'm actually doing some type of, of Gym Pro or HSAT, I'm going to make some type of appliance. So again, with my referrals, with I'm going to do a Gym Pro at no, no charge. Then I'm going to look at some other kind of of appliance. If the patient has a positive screening and I'm going to refer that patient to the to a sleep physician, I provide a copy of my screening and bruxism report. And then I document whether the patient 
has signs or symptoms of TMD, I send all of that information to the sleep physician. If the patient is one that I certainly want to treat and they have signs and symptoms of TMD, it may only be that they have a, a little crepitus in the joint. I let the sleep physician know about those TMD symptoms. I inform the sleep physician that the patient might not be a good candidate for CPAP therapy if a full face mask or nasal pillows are used with a chin strap. If a mask or chin strap is used that applies pressure to the chin, in a posterior direction, the patient's TMD symptoms could be exacerbated. When you send that letter and you send an intake exam that documents TMD symptoms, you almost always get the patient back to treat. So, two big tricks to get your patients get patients to treat. Number one, find your CPAP failures, find your partial CPAP failures, start screening your patients, and send an intake exam that documents TMD. So let me show you how I do that. Okay, this is a letter sent in 2015 to Dr. Eccles, one of my sleep physicians introducing a patient who underwent OSA TMJ screening. Oh, by the way, in my area, don't call it TMD, call it TMJ. I don't know where these guys got their tra training, but they don't know what TMD is, but they do know what TMJ is. And they don't mean the joint, they mean the dysfunction. So that's not a typo, that's on purpose. Anyway. The patient is complaining of excessive daytime sleepiness, presents subjective symptoms of OSA. Additionally, she presents with some signs and symptoms of TMJ. In my opinion, these symptoms could make it difficult for her to tolerate a full face mask CPAP or chin straps. I'm sending a copy of her TMJ screening for your review. You just put him on legal notice that he could cause TMJ symptoms. The first time you do this, you might want to send a copy of, of, a, of a study. I'll show you in just a minute. Just in case your sleep physician isn't well read. But anyway, this is a Knox T3 report. You can see the top part of it shows bruxisms, phasic and tonic and mixed, shows the total amount, shows the index. I don't even try to explain that to a sleep physician, okay? I don't even know if I understand it myself. It doesn't matter. I'm doing this to get my patient back to treat. You notice this patient has an ODI of nine and an AHI of 12, not snoring excessively. I can, I can treat this patient very, very well, and I want the patient back. So I send a copy of that report. Now, don't do this until you know this is okay with your sleep physician. If you have a gym pro, I would start with that. And I'll get over to the gym pro in a minute. Uh, my sleep physicians are well aware that I've got a Knox T3. In fact, I have several of them. And they want to actually see this report. So uh, that's what I send them. I have a bunch of documents that I use in my practice. This is one that any new patient to the practice fills out. Obviously the top part is an upward sleepiness scale. 
I assume all of you know what that means, but anyway, it's it's looking for excessive daytime sleepiness. It asks the patient to fill out their chance of, of falling asleep or dozing in eight different situations. The bottom of it is probably the most valuable piece of paper I have in my office. Let me give you a better better view of it. It literally goes through, I guess, virtually every TMD sign or symptom that you can have. And I almost never have a patient fill this thing out that something isn't marked. Obviously, this is used in our practice to go in and, and help us, I guess, be aware that this is a patient that we may need to work them up as to whether or not they have some, some TMJ symptoms. So when I get into my intake exam, I will be the first to admit it's elaborate. Now, I do use uh, software to help me. Um, the software helps me absolutely document the 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 position the patient is in as far as TMD signs or symptoms. This all makes it easier for uh, for me to, to defend in court if that were to ever happen. But more importantly, I use this information to help me get my patients back if I want them back. So anyway, obviously when we do the intake exam, we're looking for signs and symptoms of bruxism. Uh, abfractions, as we know that abfractions are, are certainly uh, give us pause and wonder if the patient is, is clenching or grinding. Most of you know Jills Levine. Um, in his Sleep Medicine for Dentist book, the 2009 edition, he went in and said at least one third of the patients with bruxism actually have sleep disorder breathing. I personally think that is an underestimation, but there is this close tie between bruxism and, TM, and TMD and sleep. We know that for many patients, once they have a, an apneic or hypopneic event, they will bru brux their teeth right at the end of the event. So just the simple fact that that you're having some bruxism, some myofascial pain, that person is something you certainly certainly need to look at as far as their uh, their sleep. So there's this weird vicious cycle between TMD and snoring and headaches and bruxism and abfractions and uh, fibromyalgia and it's it's all interconnected and i bet in a few years we'll have it linked uh just just know that any of these things that you're seeing uh leads you to question whether or not this patient actually is a is a sleep patient okay y'all need to take a a picture of this slide this is the study that tied sleep apnea to TMD. The author tested the hypothesis that OSA signs and symptoms were associated with the occurrence of TMD. He took 248 individuals and they developed first onset TMD symptoms within the 2.8 years after being diagnosed. Therefore, the, the conclusion was there's a high likelihood of OSA being associated with first onset TMD. The problem with the, with the study is that it did not document the type of CPAP that these patients were on. It just linked OSA with TMD, and it concluded that, that OSA symptoms predicted first onset TMD. 
Well, if you've gone in and documented the patient has TMD signs or symptoms and put the sleep physician on notice that a CPAP may exacerbate it, I guarantee you, you'll get those patients back. So I don't want to go into detail on how I do my intake exam, but I'm just going to give you an idea. Um, true confession, I used to lecture for Rose Nearman, and this is dental writer software. What you're seeing is obviously some TMJ or muscles of mastication. Um, mine actually are much more on my actual soft, software. I have more muscles than that that I actually palpate, but you can palpate the muscles. You can ob obviously do joint evaluations, range of motion, all of that kind of stuff, uh, the normal opening. And then down here, you can actually add to it and this is one of the little paragraphs I frequently add, and it says the patient is aware of some temporal mandibular disorder symptoms, but Dr. Burley feels that the symptoms do not rise to the level of the diagnosis of temporal mandibular dysfunction. And therefore, these symptoms, in Dr. Burley's opinion, would not prevent fabrication of a mandibular advancement device. The patient was informed for a period of of time, some additional joint tenderness and symptoms due to MAD therapy may, may be present. Patient acknowledges and understands this possible complication. Obviously, that's double talk, okay? It's recognizing there's some symptoms and so, then going in and saying, yeah, but they're not bad. We all know that, that OSA treated by a mandibular advancement device with time tmd symptoms get better they don't get worse so anyway it does not bother me at all to treat a severe tmd patient with a mandibular advancement device i just don't start off with much protrusion and i advance them very slowly and allow the joints to uh to adapt as I go. So anyway, all of this goes into my uh, into my software, and it dumps out this this uh, intake exam. Uh, this is a female that came to our office. Let me get over here where where we're into it. Range of motion measurements are at the top. Oral exam reveals ab fractions, tongue scalloping, bruxism, overbite, overjet. Uh, no tenderness listed on TMD, TMJ palpation bilaterally. Uh, you know, mild tenderness on the the uh, temporalis bilaterally on down to tenderness on rotation uh, on the right side. So anyway, um, patient was informed at the bottom for a period of time. They may have some joint tenderness. That paragraph that I told you about is in there. And um, patient acknowledges and understands the complication. So all of that, along with that initial um, Epworth and um, the picture with the patient with the side of the face, with all of that goes to the, to the sleep physician with the letter that they have TMJ symptoms. So I get the patient back, okay? When you get them back, obviously treat that patient successfully. File the insurance appropriately. This is the kind of communication. Obviously this is in soap note format. You can see the, the, the bottom, I'm in the plan part, the assessment is, right above it um you've got to communicate the very way that your sleep physicians communicate so anyway we're delivering the oral appliance for the patient tells you the tongue level and the malampati classification and here we are we've delivered the orthotic this is the first recall visit uh 
below this, you'll see the patient's data on the appliance. They see sleep seven hours each night, whereas the appliance 100% of the time, you know, retention problems, notices increased dreaming, snoring is reduced. Um, you know, they use their, their uh, morning exerciser and all that kind of stuff, utilizes it each day. Uh, excessive daytime sleepiness reduced. So anyway, we're titrating the patient and we bring her back for a, a Nox T3. So here she's back, same patient, uh, same type of thing, okay? Everything, occlusion's not changed. And we send her home with a, with a T3. Um, Patient's apnea is now, I think, my little thing has the block in front of it. I think about a three, so we're we're ready to send her to the sleep lab. So I titrate with a Gym Pro, and the Knox T3 is the final titration that I use before I send them back to the sleep lab. I think it is absolutely critical that these patients are well titrated before you send them back because if you send them back and the patient is not fixed, then you don't get the sleep physician respect, you don't get the additional referrals. So anyway, we call Dr. Dr. Eccles in the sleep lab and schedule for the overnight PSG and I actually go to the sleep lab with them. So, we're talking about the Gym Pro now. The beauty of the Gym Pro, from what, what I understand, it was designed for dentists and it was designed to get around, you know, for, for lack of better terms, much of the political nonsense that we're putting up with dealing with the HSTs. The beauty is that you get oxygen desaturations with the Gym Pro. You get it based on the, the body position of the patient at night. <coughs> Excuse me. Along with that, you get heart rate and you can determine heart rate variability along with bruxism. So, much of the things that you get with the Knox T3, you can deduce from the Gym Pro. So you're getting a bruxism, you get the type, frequency, and strength of the bruxism. Obviously, this gives you invaluable information uh, as to not only that the, the Gym Pro is, or excuse me, not only that the patient is bruxing, bruxing but how aggressively they're bruxing. Obviously, audio, you can get the snoring and the, the decibels associated with that. When we treat sleep or obstructive sleep apnea, most dentists do not understand we're not treating the event, okay? We're actually treating the heart. As apneic events or hypopneic events occur, the carotid bodies that are, that are in the carotid arteries actually detect variations in CO2. They result in cortisol being dumped into the bloodstream, which causes the whole flight or fight response, fight or flight response. So you get um, you get increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, and that's when the patient uh, becomes susceptible to stroke and heart attack and, and uh, many of the issues that, that are secondary to o OSA. So really having the heart rate and having the ability to see variations in the heart rate really is the most effective thing that you have in determining how effective the treatment is that you're providing and how the patient is responding. 
So it's in, invaluable to have the heart rate there. Obviously, oxygen desaturations gives us the ability to determine one element of the seriousness of OSA uh, on the patient. In my opinion, the AHI of the apneic patient is really a poor measurement of how severe they are. Uh, it's really not the number of apneic or a hypopneic events. It is the number of desaturations and how low that patient went. Because obviously the lower the patient goes, as far as their, their nadir of their oxygen saturation, that is a direct correlation to how severe this disease is in this patient and how aggressively you need to treat it. I have had patients that after a sleep study had an AHI of 40 and a sleep physician look at me and say, they're fixed. The reason they're fixed is their oxygen level never got below 88 and their heart rate was a flat line. He said that it was a, a chain Stokes kind of, uh, you know, event. So you have a, a feedback, you know, event and it wasn't a problem. So it's really not the, the AHI of the patient, it's the oxygen desats. So anyway, and obviously it's the oxygen desats as related to the patient's body position. So anyway, obviously this is the FPO2. This is how it looks. Uh, obviously this is a, an example patient, but the red caption is supine and green is left. And you see the, the, the coloring uh, on this patient. So you get a printout exactly of the maximum and minimum and average uh, oxygen level. Obviously heart rate, and it's really the heart rate variability that you're, that you're really looking at. So it gives you all of that information. So not only can you use the, the uh, Gym Pro as a screening tool, you certainly can use it for a titration. Now, I need to, you know, be perfectly honest. Before I send my patients back to the sleep lab, I want a number. I want actual data I can look at. So I actually have the Gym Pro and I have a Knox T3. So they don't go back to the sleep lab until I have something that I can look at and score and know uh, exactly where these patients patients fall. The Knox T3 actually computer scores it, but I can go in and look at the data and see exactly what it looks like. So anyway, heart rate analysis. In addition to that, you have the bruxism, you have the maximum force as compared to, to what they typically uh, are, uh, are bruxing or what they can do consciously. So obviously you can see how much bruxism there is. Um, all of this lo logically should get better as the airway is opened. So um, obviously a, a great piece of information. The beauty about this report is that the only thing on it that the sleep physician's really going to understand is the SpO2 and the heart rate analysis. Um, he's really not going to understand the bruxism. He'll understand the audio, but he really won't know what all of that means. Obviously, the audio is invaluable because you can see how much the patient is snoring and how loud it is. So, in conclusion, and our hour is up. I like I like both the Gym Pro and the Knox T3. I think they're both invaluable for treating our patients. Without these two pieces of equipment at this day and time, I would be lost. Both can be effectively used as screening tools. 
Understand though, if you use a Knox T3, sleep physicians are going to consider that to be a sleep study. So don't do that until you get your get an approval from a sleep physician. Okay, obviously you must titrate your mad appliances. If you send them back without effective titration, um, the appliances won't work. So this is the only way I know to successfully treat OSA patients. Uh, I can't look at a 25 year old young lady that's really tired and has TMD symptoms. I can't look at her and tell whether she's got a sleep issue. I have to test her in some way. And the Gym Pro, the Nox T3 are, are tremendous ways to screen them. And then once you get a positive screening, you feel better about referring that patient to a sleep physician. And hopefully you won't make her pay a $5,000 deductible that she didn't need. So I'd like to dedicate our little time together to my father. He uh, passed away in the middle of the night. He had a stroke. He passed away before I knew anything about sleep. My grandfather passed away in the middle of the night with a stroke. So please understand this is a deadly disease. And my only regret is that I didn't start sooner. Um, go out, you know, change the world. Uh, these two tricks that I used, um, if you have not done a diligent search for CPAP failures, do that. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I've been doing this for years and I still find one occasionally. But anyway, go find those people. Start screening. Start actively screening your patients. Don't use a doc in the box somewhere that's never seen you or your patients. Use a local sleep physician, but look for TMD symptoms. If the patients have TMD symptoms, point that out to the sleep physician. Get a copy of that study that I showed you that talks about first onset TMD symptoms. Send him a copy of that study, and I guarantee you, you'll get your patients back. Now, if this patient is a severe, severe patient, don't do that, okay? Let him treat him with the CPAP first. Don't, uh, don't make him think that you are, I guess, not taking care of the patient, because TMD will not kill the patient. OSA will. Okay, so that's about all I've got. Um, obviously, there's if there's anything that we can do to help you, uh, some of my information is here. Obviously, you know if you need my wife or I to become personally involved with your with your practice, we can certainly do that. I provide legal forms and intake forms and prescriptions and all of that kind of stuff. So I'll quit the commercial. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, Bernie, I don't know if you're listening, but I'm done. Hello? Bernie? Hello? Bernie?